All right, everybody. Thank you so much for stopping by. I'm Fede, your host for today, and I'm here with Wailing You. And we are super excited to bring you a practical introduction to LLMs. We are, you know, trying to be in trend with this. There's a lot of talk about AI and Gen AI, and we thought that we'll bring you a little bit of something here to learn alongside you. So, hello, Waylon. How are you doing today? Hey, Fede. Good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Are you ready to go? Yep. Ready to go. All right. Take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Waylon Tuya, and I'm a senior data scientist at Code Academy. And today we'll be talking about a practical introduction to LLMs. So um, we're going to start this off pretty simple um, with what is artificial intelligence? So, you know, we've heard artificial intelligence as a word thrown around, um, and I just kind of want to clear this up, but it's basically a machine's ability to perform the cognitive functions that we associate with human minds. Um, and artificial intelligence as a practice uh, encompasses machine learning and deep learning uh, within it. So it's been around since the 1950s, although recently, as we all know, this has been a huge resurgence of it. Um, and most of the breakthroughs that we've seen today is actually thanks to deep learning. So within this very uh, smaller scope within artificial intelligence, it's really pushing the field forward. Um, so going back to, you know, artificial intelligence, AI, I want to talk about a bit about machine learning. Uh, I'm just going to assume um, no prior knowledge of data and machine learning and whatsoever. So just kind of give you a brief overview of what machine learning is. Um, and in this diagram on the right, it's kind of uh, showing you what machine learning in action. So it's a, machine learning is as simple as the linear regression we might have learned in school. And essentially, it needs some data points, uh, some computing power, and a mathematical mathematical formula that uh, you're trying to optimize. So um, in this GIF to the right, you can see that we have a, our set of data points. And uh, using um, the computing, you know, our computers and uh, our, form our formula, which is basically trying to minimize the distance between data points and the line, which is the model, we can, with many iterations, start approximating um, that those little dots with our model, which is a line. And you know, you do this long enough and you get uh, pretty good impress pretty impressive results. And you can you have a model that can predict the future, essentially, or predict things. Um, and so going back to that diagram, within machine learning, there is deep learning, which is um, basically a subset of machine learning, and it's to do with neural networks. So what is neural networks? Uh, what is deep learning? It's a discipline within AI that teaches computers to process data in a way that is inspired by the human brain. So on the right here, you can see, you know, uh, tons of layers, um, and that is essentially a neural network. And this, uh, you can see the the hidden layers within them. Those are uh, what makes a neural network deep. If there are a lot of hidden layers, it's a deep neural network. If there aren't that many, then it's a, very, a shallow neural network. And anytime you hear about modern you know, advanced capabilities of AI. It's because we have uh, a lot of a lot of research and compute power that we can run these deep learning, uh, deep neural networks, and um, essentially that's what's driving AI forward right now. Um, so now that we know, you know, what neural networks are, um, I want to kind of touch briefly on how we can teach neural networks how to learn English. So English, I'm going to call it. Uh, so that's natural language. Um, it's basically, you know, a natural language is any language that we speak as humans. But how do we teach a uh, neural network to learn a natural language? Uh, computers are can only process numbers, and they're very good at them. But um, you know that numbers are not the same as natural language. So uh, we have to find a way to transcribe or uh, to decode, encode, and decode numbers into language, and vice versa. So going back, um, a vector. Uh, so computers are very good at working with vectors and the vectors can be uh, in this example, you know, 0 0.2, negative 5.3, 6, a series of numbers, right? And in order to under for them to understand English, we have to turn them um, into, um, basically turn English into numbers. So what if we say 100 is hello and 001 is goodbye? That essentially could work if we have um, a way to, to store that information and that mapping, right? So 
that is a very basic example of uh, an embedding. Uh, so anytime you, anytime you hear the word embedding within the NLP, the natural language processing and uh, LLM uh, field, then just think of transcri- um, turning a set of uh, numbers into English language or natural language or vice versa. So this example that I gave was actually kind of simple. We could actually do a lot better. Um, one zero zero to and zero zero one is very like arbitrary. I just pick those numbers on a whim. But uh, on this example to the right, we can see there is uh, word to vec, which is one of the most famous techniques, um, which was developed I think in mid twenty, maybe 2013, 14. Um, but essentially, you can see that uh, in this we have this space and we have uh, map wo- uh, man, woman, king, and queen right in this space. And you see that there is some structure to that data. It's not arbitrarily spaced out. Um, if we take the distance from uh, man and woman to king and queen, it's actually the same distance. So it's actually helpful to structure your embeddings in a certain way that makes actual sense to you know someone looking at it at also, and also to the machine. Because uh, essentially, um, that structure get, does help a machine uh, understand uh, language better. So now that we've talked about a little bit about embeddings and you know general um, uh, deep learning, we can talk about the rise of large language models. Uh, so since before 2017, there were large language models, but they did not exist as we know them today. Um, really, this all started with a paper uh, called Attention is All You Need. Uh, that is a paper by Google in 2017, where they describe a transformer architecture. And essentially what a transformer architecture is, is I was talking about neural networks and how there are many layers in between them. A transformer is basically one of those layers, or um, I guess a set, it could be a set of layers uh, within that neural network. And that architecture, this was pretty novel back in the day, allows LLMs um, to kind of pay attention to the entire question at hand instead of uh, maybe to certain parts, um, I guess. It, it allows basically this attention mechanism, kind of like what we, uh, know as attention to um, for so allows the LLM to basically look at each part of the question that you provided and then kind of really understand what it's talking about. So this kicked off a family of models, GPT, but uh, now we rec- more recently Llama two, uh, Llama Llama two, um, and fast forward to today, we have even more models. So um, Claude, Bloom, Falcon, all these models that are open source. Uh, so it's super cool to see. Um, this explosion of models in this domain. So now I want to kind of talk about how, you know, given all these models and all this, um, all these new exciting uh, tools and apps and models out there, what can we do beyond chat We've, um, uh, you know, we've kind of messaged, uh, so we've kind of touched upon uh, chat GPT. I'm sure a lot of you have used it and, you know, just go on and type a message and get a response but kind of keeps you in the box, right? Like what if we want to do more with, with the API? Um, what more can we do? So I want to talk about um, basically ChatGPT in this case is a closed source model. Um, and, you know, of, of course it's owned by OpenAI. Um, and on the other side, we have this open source um, models, the, the llamas, the... Uh, the blooms, or sorry, uh, the clouds, the falcons, uh, that we can uh, actually tweak uh, a lot and actually, um, you know, do, use it uh, and host it ourselves, right? So, what are the strengths of having you and using these open source models? Well, first of all, you don't need to send data anywhere outside of your organization. You can um, actually use all that data within the, the machine you're hosting it on. Uh, you're not dependent on third party. Uh, changes. So if OpenAI changes something, Llama 2, for example, if you're using it, you know, if you have your own setup, it doesn't change at all. They can be more customizable. So there are tons of tools out there um, by the open source communities that you can leverage to you uh, these days. So it's, that's kind of cool. And you get more flex- uh, freedom and flexibility when you use um, Llama 2, for example. Um, so one one use case is if you want to use um, an open source LLM model to write uh, like a horror film script, right? So if you use Llama 2, you might get, um, it's easier to write uh, to get the details versus if you use OpenAI, they might say, oh, this is too graphic. Like, we can't 
generate a script uh, like this because it's against their policy. So, um, you know, if you're a filmmaker, maybe you can get some benefits of using a open source model. So now on the other side, what are the strengths of open AI and closed source models? So if we, uh, one good thing is that open AI manages a lot of the infrastructure and backend. So um, it's very easy to use and GPT 3.5 slash four would actually perform much better than your open source models. This is because they're running it in the backend on, in huge data centers versus if you're running an open source model, you're probably running on a smaller computer. Uh, you probably don't have as much budget. And for what it's worth uh, using GPT, it's very cheap compared to um, the amount of power and uh, that you're getting. For, uh, basically, a lot of bang for your buck because you're getting a better model and a lot of times it can be cheaper than open source. Um, and you know they say they don't train on your API data, which is it's you know it's it's good that they're um, they they claim that. Um, and however, of course, if you you're working with really secure data, you you don't even want to take that chance of sending your data to someone else. So uh, pros and cons. If you're but essentially, if you're you know if your use case is um, pretty general and and basic, I would say stick to um, OpenAI GBT because of its ease of use, its cheap prices and the proper performance. But if you have something more um, that you want to keep private or you want more customizable, then um, and open source LLM like Llama 2 might be the way to go. So, you know, I've been talking about Llama 2 and that's because it's one of the best open source models out there that's commercially available uh, to the public. So basically, a company, most companies um, can leverage something like that and use it for themselves. Um, uh, it has a bunch of sizes. Of, uh, so it comes with a bunch of parameters. So from all the way down from 7 billion parameters to 70, 70 billion parameters. Um, however, it's still not as good and as big as GPT 3.5, which is 175 billion parameters. Um, but it is one of the best options you have if you want to host something locally. And you can see um, in the open source and closed source benchmarks to the right um, that Llama 2 performs probably uh, at the top of the, of the open source uh, models, but still has some ways to go uh, when compared to GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. Another tool that um, I would highly encourage uh, y'all to check out if you're interested in LLMs is Hugging Face. So it's basically a GitHub of models and it allows users to save models on there to share ideas and collaborate better. And it's heavily used by the open source people. So it's a great way to, um, you know, if you have a model and you wanna try it out, uh, it's a great way to just go on Hugging Face, download it, um, try it out. Um, they have a lot of other features out there um, and they have tons of models that you can play around with. So that's just another, if you're getting into this, um, something worth considering. And techniques for customizing. So now that we've talked about kind of what is AI, how it generally works and um, the landscape out there, I, I kind of want to touch upon um, how we can customize these models to, to do our bidding better, right? Um, so why would we even want to customize LLMs in the first place? So ChatGPT is great, but it's training data ends around September, 2021. So it doesn't know anything beyond that point, right? And so um, if you ask it a question about recent event, it's not gonna know. And so you're gonna have, the, you, want, you wanna find some way around that, right? The good thing is the hard work is done for us. Uh, training GPT-4 costs a lot of money. And with comparatively small incremental changes, we can actually um, tweak GPT-4 or any of these open source LLM models to um, do our bidding. So uh, there are two main ways. The first one is called retrieval augmented generation. The second one is fine tuning. Um, retrieval augmented generation, also known as RAG, is probably the first way uh, you always want to consider because it's a simpler approach. Here we can see kind of um, a diagram on the right of what uh, retrieval augmented generation is. And essentially, um, when a user asks a question, uh, you know, on, on the right, it's the query arrow pointing. Um, the, the, the query first comes to a, a system where it's basically 
routed to um, a, a set a data set, right? So basically, you have an LLM. Imagine an LLM on the side, and you have uh, your own data set, your own propri proprietary data set domain um, on you know kind of on the side, right? And whenever a user asks a question, instead of asking the LLM directly, so say I have a billing question, right? Uh, and I'm, and I'm a, working in a customer service department. If I have a user ask, ask a question, it can go to the base LLM, but it can, the base LLM will be like, well, I don't know what our policies are. Um, and you know, it can give a very generic answer. So instead we can have that question get routed uh, to a specific uh, domain, a data set first. And we can compare that question. So if it's a question about billing, we can get, hey, uh, the most, you know, top five most recent, uh, most similar questions about billing in, in our data set. So these are the problems that other users have dealt with. And like these are, these are how they've been solved. And then we can get, uh, because, uh, so we do a similarity comparison and we can get the top five and we can feed, then feed the, the query and the relevant documents to the base LLM. So we're basically saying, hey, GPT or Llama 2, um, based on these you know, five similar queries where the user had a problem with uh, their billing, how would you solve this uh, new problem? Uh, and then that's the query of the user. And then it will generate a much better response because uh, then it, can, it has a context to say, oh, this is what happened in the past, and this is probably what should happen uh, now. And then that response gets forwarded back to the user. So that's retrieval augment generation. You're, augmenting, um, uh, you're basically retrieving data documents and you're using those documents to augment uh, the generation of text uh, using your LLM. Um, so now we can talk about vector databases. Um, going back to um, what we're, to our example here uh, where we are talking about a domain specific data set, that's actually um, a vector database. And so when we talk about RAG, basically, um, we need somewhere to store all our data, right? And that's why um, vector databases exist. So if you're familiar with relational databases, which is SQL, uh, they store tables, but relational uh, vector databases store vectors. And they make it very easy for us to compare uh, certain vectors because they're all, um, it's optimized to do that, right? And so in this uh, picture on the right, we can see, you know, uh, we can see kind of a word cloud and we can see certain words that are clustered together. So this is essentially what we're envisioning uh, is an embedding. And so we, you can see that, you know, you look for software uh, and then you can see um, Excel, Oracle, Web, Microsoft, all in that cloud, right? They're all very close together because they're all related to this software um, realm, I guess. And so um, using vector databases, we can really easily find vectors that are similar. Uh, and these vectors can be, you know, just single words or entire queries. Um, and so uh, some popular ones that we can use, if you're interested, are ChromaDB and Pinecone, which are one of the most, those two I feel like are the most popular ones, but there are tons out there uh, that um, are available to try out as well. Um, now we can talk about supervised fine tuning. So we talked about uh, retrieval augmented generation, which is you don't touch the model, you just basically feed it additional context based on some other data. Um, but what if we want to do something more? What if you want to incorporate your actual data into the model itself? So that's, you know, in some cases that's better because the model then actually, you know, internalizes all that data and like learns from that better. So um, it's you have one, uh, you know, smarter model than rather than like a pieces of um you know a whole system right and so it's very sim to fine-tune something it's very similar uh to uh how you you train a machine learning model you're basically giving it data set so a data set so in this um example we have um an instruction on the right and an output on the left and given a set of instructions you're gonna uh, tell it to output a certain um i guess data in a certain way right so you have you feed it this data and um, over time, you know, given a certain number of uh, iterations and, and after it processes all that data, it will have um, kind of learned, if you did it properly, it will, it will slowly learn um, and be fine-tuned towards your use case. And so libraries on Hugging Face, which I bring up again, because they have a lot of libraries um, that are useful for um, 
for this. And so there are great ways to to um play to fine tune models, and you can um play around with ways that are I haven't even talked about here, but like um it's they're both they're all like uh it's it's super useful and you should check them out basically. Um and when we talk about fine tuning, there's a, there's a full fine tuning and there's Laura fine tuning, um, and as well as a bunch of other ways. Um, full fine tuning essentially is um, you're like I said before, you're training you're training the entire model um, again with your data. Uh, I guess enhancing it with your data, but it is expensive because you have to uh, train a lot of parameters, and it's infeasible for most people. Um, because that's it gets expensive, and it also there are risks associated with it, like catastrophic forgetting, where you're you train a bunch of things, but it'll forget some other things uh, if you don't do it properly. So here we're going to touch upon LoRa's uh, low rank adapters. Um, essentially, what they are is it uses a trick. So uh, let me just talk about this trick first. And if you're familiar with, with linear algebra, you might have seen this trick done before. But it uses decomposition, which is basically if you have a huge matrix of say a million numbers, a thousand by a thousand matrix, right? So a thousand rows, a thousand columns, if you multiply those two uh, uh, numbers together, you get a million numbers. So that's a million numbers you have to keep in memory to um, remember, right? Uh, Laura basically is saying, uh, is uses a trick where you can actually approximate those million numbers with two smaller skinny matrices. So if you take two, a thousand by five matrices, um, you can actually, you know, I, I say a thousand by five in this case, but you can actually make that five, 10 or 20, but, and that just kind of tweaks how much you're approximating your, um, your original matrix. But if you take these a thousand by five matrices and you multiply them together, you can actually get, uh, a million, um, numbers, but you're actually storing them as 10,000 numbers. And so this is a, a cool trick because you're storing 10,000 numbers now versus, um, you're storing, you were storing a million numbers before. So that's an improvement of like a comparison of, uh, I guess you're now only storing 1% of that data versus a million, uh, which is hundred percent of that data. Um, so Laura uses this trick. Um, it freezes whenever you do Laura, you're basically freezing your original LLM model. So let's take, we have, let's say we have Llama two, we're taking all our, uh, parameters of Llama two and we're freezing those um, so they can't change and we can't mess them up, right? And then we extract approximations of uh, those pre-trained weights uh, in a separate, uh, on the side, right? And then what we do with that is kind of what I said before, you you have this huge table of weights, but then you can actually decompose that to two smaller tables. And then you can, uh, basically you can fine tune these two smaller uh, matrices. And essentially what you're doing is you're cutting the computational load um, by, uh, significantly, and um, you can get pretty good results that way. Uh, and you can train it yourself, um, you know, on our on consumer hardware, which is a pretty great thing. Uh, and essentially, what happens is that you can actually train multiple LoRa. So now you can see that um, if you're familiar, you, there there are websites out there that allows you to post your LoRa's up there, upload your LoRa's, and then anyone else um, can actually download them, and they have the same model. They can kind of slot them in and use that LoRa to tweak their results. Um, so essentially you get a lot of modularity with this. Uh, if you have, for example, an angry LoRa and a happy LoRa, you can get your base Llama 2 model and then you can slot each one in. And if you slot in your happy LoRa, it can maybe produce uh, text with, uh, you know, in a very cheerful note. But if you have an angry LoRa, you can slot it in and maybe you can make your, um, other than produce text with an angry manner, right? Um, so this is kind of cool to to cool ways to personalize um, what your model can do. Another thing I want to uh, touch upon is quantization. So um, if you're not familiar with this, so basically, is uh, models are usually trained in FP32, meaning it takes 32 bits to encode a number, right? So 30, just 32 pieces of information, zeros and ones, right? To represent a number. Um, however, it was discovered that we don't actually need to work with all 32 bits all the time. And that there are little tricks that we can um, work with to save in terms of memory. Um, so we can actually get by with storing our weights in eight bits or even four bits. 
And then what we do is we can change them back to 32 bits uh, during calculation time. Um, and essentially, uh, if you uh, if this doesn't make sense to you, essentially what, um, what we're doing is 30, taking 32 bits of information and replacing that with eight bits, right? And we're kind of summarizing that data in eight bits. Um, and so 32 divided by eight is four. So you get a four times reduction in memory footprint, but you get kind of the gist of uh, your information still saved in there. So an example I have um, is the cars on, that you see on the right. You know, if we can save the full resolution car um, and, you know, you see the car, you see all the pieces of information. But if we want to kind of compress it down, uh, we can actually, you know, use a blurrier version of the image. Um, imagine this blurriness is actually saves us um, uh, memory. So um, we can still tell if you look at the picture on the, on the left that it's still a car. We just can't tell, uh, you know, maybe the details, but you can, in general, make out that it's still a car. The gist gets across, right? It gets across, right? So um, quantization is similar in the way that, like, it'll get you, it summarizes and there's some loss of information. But uh, if you do it properly, um, it's still very useful and you can, uh, it can still kind of do your bidding as you want it to. And... Lastly, I want to talk about QLORA, which is a combination of LORA and quantization. So it's taking the, these uh, little tricks that we've learned and then putting them all together, which is uh, very neat. Uh, it comes all together, it comes together very uh, nicely. And um, there is a whole paper out there talk about, talking about QLORA. Um, but uh, so if you're interested, feel free to go online and search that up. But essentially, I just kind of want to showcase uh, Kilora here, how cool it is. Um, we can fine tune a 65 billion parameter model in one single GPU. Um, and that reduces basically this memory footprint from 780 gigabytes to 48 gigabytes. So 16 times smaller, right? Um, if you're familiar with GPUs, you know that 70, 780 gigabytes of RAM, like you can't fit that into any consumer GPU. So because of Kilora, we can actually uh, train things ourselves um, if we have, you know, a 48 gigabyte GPU, which is still pretty expensive. Um, and the, the creators of Guanaco, um, which is another chat LLM out there, um, actually used QLORA to train the 33 billion parameter Llama model, and it got to 97, so 98% of chat GBT's performance. You know, I, th I feel like this, this case um, kind of show, this example kind of showcases the power of uh, Laura's and quantization. And granted, you know, this is probably the best case. Um, I'm sure there are the kids out there where um, QLORA actually, you know, you will lose some information and won't, uh, you, it won't perform as well as, um, you know, a fully trained fine-tuned model. Um, but there are cases where um, customizing it uh, this way can be very useful. And it's evident here as another fun fact here is that the, the model actually beat GPT 3.5 at chess. So, you know, not uh, always not always super helpful, but when it does work, it can be um, uh, pretty useful and it can run on consumer hardware, which is what's important. And that brings us to the end of our discussion today. I hope I hope that everyone learned something um, about LLMs, and I'm happy to take questions now. Let me take a look at the awesome. Thank you so much. That was uh, a lot of information. I feel like people are going to be processing that for a little bit. Um, we did have a question earlier. Somebody mm -hmm. said, hello, with all this chat GPT, Grok, Llama, is it worth it to learn machine learning from the beginning to build AI models? Um, I think... When we, so again, when we talk about machine learning, um, it's a very big field uh, and we're chat GPT, Grok, Llama, that's specifically that's deep learning. Um, if we're talking about machine learning, there is still a lot of use cases of machine learning beyond uh, simpler cases, right? So if you want to, um, you know, uh, predict, uh, you know, if you want to do linear regression or um, for simple use cases, machine learning is definitely still useful. I would say uh, with all these free tools out there, it, um, if you want to build another free tool such as Llama, that's going to be very hard unless you're learning machine learning to go work at a big tech company to train um, a model there. But if you want to train a model yourself, that's going to be very hard because 
you're going to need a lot of funding uh, to run big GPUs um, in the cloud, and you're going to need a lot of data, and you're going to need to know, you know, how to do all of that, right? So one single person, it's very hard for them to do that. And uh, so I would say you should still learn machine learning to, you know, if you want to join teams that develop this, like these tools are developed by entire teams. Um, and, and understanding machine learning is definitely useful. But now that these tools are available, it definitely lowers the barriers to entry, democratizes um, AI for everyone. Uh, so people without knowledge of it can use them, um, you know, and to 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 be productive. Do you think that this is a side effect of the way that people learn this sort of uh, like the introduction to this kind of field? I feel, I feel like um, when you're a total novice and you just get into tech you might just hear, hey, go learn machine learning or mm -hmm. go learn data science. Like it's just yeah. a very generalistic approach to the field. Yeah. So that might be creating some confusion when people say, well, is it worth learning the entire field yeah. to get into it? And I think you are, you're saying that it's, it's more about learning all the basics so that you can then dig deeper into the part of the field that you're interested in? Yes, yes, I would say that. Um, it's a huge field. No one is... Um, you know, an expert in everything, but there are people who are experts in certain segments of it, right? And as someone who's getting into coding, um, you might hear about machine learning, but um, it's actually kind of a mixed discipline, right? You To learn machine learning, you, you have to know coding and how to program, but you also have to know uh, statistics and math and linear algebra. It's very multidisciplinary. multidisciplinary. So um, I would say you learn coding first. And then on the side, you kind of tinker with machine learning to, if you're interested. And then um, that's like the best way to um, go to kind of progress in both ways. If you straight go into machine learning, there is a lot of things that you might not know about general programming. Uh, and you might miss out on that. Um, and in a lot of ways, machine learning jobs are hard to come by for um, self-taught people. So um, if you're talking about, if you're looking at um, all these you know, research, machine learning jobs, engineers, um, a lot, oftentimes they'll require a master's or a PhD. Uh, we, you can get it with a bachelor's degree as well, but like uh, it's much easier to, you know, do a boot camp or go through Code Academy and get a programming job first and then jump to machine learning later on. Just because it encompasses so many fields that um, it's, yeah, it's 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 very complicated uh, field. I, I mean, what do you think that is? It, it feels very obscured. Like it's really yeah. hard to just jump in it. Uh, it. It sounds like it's more adjacent. Like you get a job in tech in somewhere that is somewhat related yeah. or it's, or you either are already on track from like your college degree. Like you, you know, you, you already picked a, a degree, an undergraduate that you knew was going to drive into a master's, which was going to drive into a PhD that was going to, it just sounds like it's a, it's a, maybe not as straightforward as people that decide to be web developers, for example, where it's a very clear, right. here's the stack, here's the things you learn, and that's going to get you a, a junior, uh, you know, an entry level job. And I think this is connected to one of the questions we had in the chat that said, uh, there is a barrier to entry level jobs in deep learning jobs. Are LLMs a thing that can get me into the door? Hmm. Um, I would say LLMs are not a thing that can get you into the door of deep learning jobs because you're trying to build LLMs in a deep learning job. So you can't, I guess you can't just use LLMs to um, do your job for you. I mean, I, I, hopefully at some point in the future we can, but for now, LLMs um, are not that smart yet. And so you can maybe use LMs to learn some concepts. Um, you know, if you have any questions, ask ChatGPT. It's great for learning, but it'll it won't do your job for you, especially if you're um, trying to get a deep learning job, right? Um, and I think going back to your question of why it's kind of obscure, I think in some ways the field is progressing so rapidly that um, schools haven't caught up with it yet. Schools just caught up with the software engineering wave and like education, this, uh, I guess the entire education industry, right? So now we have boot camps um, and programs for software engineers and computer science, right? Um, but, you know, when we look, there's nothing for deep learning, there's nothing for machine learning just yet. And that's because, like I said, it's A, it's very multidisciplinary. It's a lot of that work is research focused. And um, when you're 
you know, when you're re- when you're hiring someone for research, you want someone who's experienced with research, and um, those who tend to be the ones with PhDs who have um, worked a lot with, uh, you know, professors researching whatever uh, field they are in, right? So they they're they're familiar with the aspect. That said, they are, um, I guess, more uh, machine learning engineers and and data scientists um, that are more on the product side or you know more more work more with the business. And so those kind of are closer related to software engineering jobs, um, but you still there's still um, you still have to know these you know the models and frameworks, and you have to learn SQL as long as Python and and all these you know bunch of other things the stack entire stack right and so those are we're seeing more um in bootcamp pro- programs and we're seeing more in uh master's programs but um as a researcher i think uh, it requires a lot of education to get to that point wow yeah that's a really good point that it's moving so fast that it's not even clear what is it that you should be learning like i guess if, even as a professional i guess it's probably a bit of a race to to be on top of everything i mean you know open ai just did like a presentation a couple of days ago a lot of new things coming out um we had here a question from earlier from maria asking the deeper the neural network does that make it a bigger black box and how could we mitigate it or find ways to control it right uh yes i would say the deeper neural network the bigger the black box essentially black box is you don't know what's happening, right? And when you're adding more layers uh, into the neural network, um, you're making that very complicated. Uh, it's not, you know, you can go decipher it, but most people will not be able to decipher what's going on, or it will take a lot of work to decipher it. And so uh, the deeper you make it, you add in complexity, it's making a more black box approach. Um, actually, if you're, if you're just learning about neural networks, if you have a very shallow neural neural network, it basically is uh, the same as a simple linear regression, but just um, kind of um, visualized in a different way. So a very shallow neural network is the same as a regression, and it performs very similarly. It can perform, um, you know, uh, predictions on like linear tasks. Um, but when you add more complexity to it, that uh, line that I kind of showcased at the beginning of like you know you're kind of fitting the line to data that line instead of a straight line can become curvy, wavy, like it becomes a function, right? And so um, it can get very complicated, but it can it also means it can get very good at approximating, um, you know, data of different shapes. It's, um, it almost makes me think of uh, linear regressions versus, versus polynomial regressions, I guess. Yes. Um, I guess, I think, I don't know if I'm wrong with this, but I think I remember... Uh, testing out shallow models with MATLAB. It was like a really easy way, like a really good environment to like see it in action, how you would just have, it would be very shallow, few nodes, and you could actually like see how it was changing the output, like very, very yeah. cool. Um, yeah, MATLAB, one of those tools. Uh, do you, you know, you were talking before about data in different, you were talking about different parts of data science. Um, it sounds like people that want to go into these field might find themselves first going into more of uh, data analytics jobs or data wrangling jobs where yeah. you're sort of like working with data, but you're not working in the model yeah. that is using the data. You just, it's, I don't know if you can explain to the people that are watching uh, sort of like the faces. I think you touched into that in your presentation of how, you know, you ingest the data, then you process the data, which is like, you know, the fancy models and stuff. And then there's the output, which is what you get from ChatGPT at the end, right? Um, mm-hmm. It sounds like most people are really interested in the middle part, like the modeling and the mathematics of it. Yeah. But mo- but realistically, most people will end up in the front end yeah. of that process, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think in general, even it, it sounds the coolest. It's like the coolest part to work on, the middle part with all the math. But it's also um, actually in some ways the most scalable. So you need uh, you know a few people, uh, a few smart people, uh, can make a very good model and then they can just send that out, you know, basically chat GBT, right? Like uh, a company has made a model and they can send that out and everyone else can use it. And it doesn't require that many uh, other, other humans to kind of maintain it. And or, I mean, it does, but like not in the scale that we we're talking about, right? Versus in the beginning end of that, uh, cleaning data, analyzing data, um, giving insights, that 
uh, at least LLMs, you know, they're starting to be able to do some of those things, but um, they still can't do it very uh, fast and very efficiently and like uh, very insightfully, right? And so that's why I would say, yes, most people will end up at that first uh, part as data analysts. You're cleaning data, you're um, visualizing it, you're kind of uh, maybe doing experiments on it and like playing with that data. And so uh, it's still very uh, incredibly useful for a business to, to have people do that. But um, yeah, and then most people will not be able to um, work with the advanced math concepts directly off the bat. And even if you do, I think uh, there is, you know, as much demand as there is for that kind of um, talent, there comparatively, I think there's a lot more work to be done um, on the, f the front side of that, or the data cleaning, for example, um, there's and data visualization and analysis, like, there's a lot more demand for, you know, if you, if you're talking to a product manager, they're going to be like, Oh, what's, uh, what's going on with my data? Like, um, how are, how is onboarding going on? Right. How do you, or what are the pieces of data you're looking at? Like all these questions, um, you want to be able to analyze and give answers to that. And, um, there are a lot of these questions around, right. Uh, versus, um, the other side is like, Oh, can you build me a machine learning model to predict X, Y, Z, right. If, uh, unless you're working at a big tech company that has a budget and wants to develop, like, spend that kind of money in, into uh, researching all these things, it's hard to um, uh, dive into it straight away because also um, the, this math, the, the more um, uh, mathematical and machine learning part, there is, you're making something, but it might not actually work out as well as you want it to, right? So um, it, there is more of a risk in, in that sense. Mm hmm Awesome. Great answer. Uh, here, going back to the chat, somebody was asking about OpenAI and saying that they, they heard that OpenAI is able to use specific versions of the LLM just to answer specific questions. So mm -hmm. I guess they're just kind of like optimizing, you know, you don't want to kill flies with a cannon, so to speak. Yeah. So um, they were just wondering if you have any any thoughts on that on like how, I guess, how they're doing that or like what what why is that useful? Yeah. So uh as i'm assuming that's related to the gpts uh that they just released a few a few days ago or yesterday what um but essentially that goes back i haven't read too much into uh, it yet but i'm assuming in some in a lot of ways that goes back to the retrieval augmented generation in which they are taking um essentially um well you can do this yourself and there are tons of companies that actually do this right if you're um you know say you want to make a LLM for uh, a law business, right? That you can take uh, your, your you know, law books and like kind of get all that data and um, have um, your own database and have LLMs kind of interact with it and respond based on uh, this data that they're, uh, you're returning. So I'm assuming the GPTs that uh, OpenAI are releasing are, uh, could be based on, on that sort of architecture where they're, um, there's a lot of like expert um, knowledge in one place and they're kind of referencing that or um, yeah, I guess that that's, if you ask me like, what's my intuition, that's kind of my hunch that that's where they're getting at. And I, I, I know there are tons of startups that were doing that because they're like, oh, it's so cool. Can we just use GPT and like uh, plug in our data and then we have a product and we can make our mm -hmm. own startup. Right. I know a lot of them are uh, getting disruptive by by this because now it's like oh wait uh, people would probably rather just go to GPT uh, open AI to for that functionality <laughs> they, they build an entire business model out of a wrapper of chat GPT and then open AI said well we can just do that in-house too exactly uh, <laughs> yeah um somebody here okay so there's a question here for Michael asking about uh if there are any methods to assure the responses for LLMs meet standards or if there's ways to track when you change an LLM, if that's going to affect the way that it halluc hallucinates or I guess um, it puts out, puts out. Yeah, I think uh, people usually use benchmarks. A lot of this LLM stuff is um, actually, uh, so uh, a lot of it requires human feedback. Uh, for example, when you train an LLM GPT, all your, um, like basically the base GPT model, all it does is output and it's a very good com sentence completioner, right? So it'll output, words are similar to um, to what you, you kind of like the topic that you asked, but it might give you just gibberish. 
And to make GPT chat GPT, that takes a lot of humans to actually create a data set um, that makes sense. And uh, they use re re reinforcement learning uh, and human feedback to uh, kind of accomplish that. So um, I'm not the most versed in it, but I would say I think there it takes a lot of humans to kind of actually, um, uh, I guess, bet that. And they've actually created benchmarks to to score, um, you know, basically these these sets of tests that models can go with through and and take them and like kind of like they get a score at the end to see like oh how good and how helpful you were as a model. That's the 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 main ways that um, I've seen these models being compared as as to how good they are. Sounds like a lot of manual work. It reminds me of uh, Amazon Turks and classifying a thousand cat photos a yeah. day just to try and train something. I, I guess, yeah, um, you have to do you have to do what you gotta do to train these models. Um, I know that some people were talking about uh, using AI agents to train the mm -hmm. AI, but I guess that goes into the whole idea of like, well, you're just putting a lot of trust in that AI agent doing the right thing, right? Like, otherwise, they're just going like, to spiral totally out of control, um, not knowing really what's going to... Like, I guess you will have to have a, a really high level of confidence and pre predictability in that AI agents to let it train other AIs, right? Right, exactly. And, I mean, it's it's been done, for example, in the sense of, like, um, you can use AI responses to train, such as the example I gave about uh, Guanaco training to JATGPT data and, you know, a lot of models can you can train to chat GPT outputs and inputs, and that actually is um that's pretty feasible. But if you're talking about like automating that entire process and like doing it large scale, I would say um you know the, the you can still do it, but the quality of the data, the outputs are not vetted, right? And so unless you have someone they're ensuring uh that the quality is good, you might get predictions and get outputs that are not as good as you expected. And yeah, I think I think essentially um yeah, basically you want um they found that these data sets like a good way to make your model better is by having very high quality data sets. And if you're just outputting input and outputting gibberish or like uh not very helpful, very generic uh answers, you might not uh, get the answers that uh, you want in your own model. I can only wait to see what Grok comes out with uh, training on on X uh, and all those tweets. Uh, I don't know if you call that a high quality data set. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so we can close off with uh, one last question. I guess this will be more open ended, so just feel free to uh, answer however you want. Uh, somebody was wondering how you believe that the endpoint of AI or like what's the top reach of AI. So maybe. If you can imagine the way that AI is progressing right now, Gen AI and all these tools, maybe looking 10, 15, 20 years down the road, as far as you can imagine, uh, what do you see AI going towards? Yeah. Um, I honestly, I think there it's as much of a guess as, you know, my guess is anyone else's. Um, I would say uh, there's certainly uh, a lot of room for um for progress and AI, like we, we've come a long way, but there's still so far to go. And there, uh, we will probably see AI incorporated in all these um, other tools and other use cases that we don't see as of now. So is it a game changer? I definitely think it is. Um, but at the same time, I think there are problems that we're um, gonna run into. Uh, so for example, uh, one thing right now is like, you know, our models are huge, right? And there's this thing about how do we, carry this model, this huge model, and like uh, have it inference on like edge devices, right? So basically your cell phone, how does your cell phone, um, how will it be able to process these large models? And so um, I know there's a this rise of analog computing um, that they talk about, where it's basically, it's almost like, oh, we've, you know, we've done all this in the digital realm and we want to kind of carry that to um, the analog, uh, like kind of like real life and like use analog computers, which are these like, it's a, it's a it's a different way of computing, but um, I I want to say that we'll see that more so. It's like we've we've advanced a lot, but now we might have to backtrack a little bit to say like, oh, you know, these are actually some of the downsides that we see with these models, and these are um, alternatives to get around it. And so we might kind of pull back in some ways and advance uh, in those areas. And then all in all, though, I think we we will see. Um, you know, I don't think 
it will be it will spell out doom or you know i'm not kind of a doom boom kind of guy but i do think it'll, it'll be very uh useful for day-to-day tasks in the future nice awesome i think it's like um it's like the way that UI has changed, right? With like web, you look at websites from 2000 and you look mm-hmm. at websites now, how much interactive they are, how much media there is in it. Like, and, and the, you know, websites from 20 years ago look prehistoric. Like it's just text. Yeah. Um, I, I know, I, I remember seeing somebody online saying in a conversation that AI is going to change the way that we understand how things just work. Like what we expect things functionally wise to be. And mm-hmm. it's just going to integrate in those small ways where your app might do things that they couldn't do before. Your services might answer questions like be do things and then people will just get used to it. And yeah. you don't realize that, you know, this whole wave of JNAI is what enabled uh, those little things to, to just make your life easier, I guess. Um, yeah. Even if it doesn't change the world in a big way, right? Yeah. Agreed. Um, agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Wailing to you for stopping by, sharing what you know with the community and with everybody on YouTube. If you enjoyed today's programming, please subscribe and keep up with Code Academy's social media. We post over there every time that we have a live event, every time we have guest speakers, and every time that we have new curriculum content going out. It's like uh, lately, we up- upgraded or React courses to V18, for example. So. We'll see you next time. Thank you for stopping by and having have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. And that's it.